Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, let's see if this clicker works. Yes. That's me. Uh, I've been, I'm an engineering director here at Facebook, and I run our mobile infrastructure engineering team. We're responsible for building the common libraries and frameworks for all of our mobile apps so that uh, product teams can build incredible features on top of them at speed. I've been at Facebook for a little over three years, and I've worked on a lot of different things at this company, including newsfeed and photos and search. And, uh, and I've been doing mobile for almost a year here. And we've learned some interesting lessons along the way, the three years I've been at Facebook and uh, even the one year I've been doing mobile myself. Um, let me start by putting this in context. It will come as a big surprise to all the attendees of the Mobile at Scale conference that uh, uh, mobile's a big deal. Um, and certainly we know it's a big deal because it has come on very, very quickly and has, its reach is huge. We've gone from zero to six billion mobile users in a comparative blink of an eye, historically speaking. Um, there's another reason why mobile is important, and that is that they are personal. They represent our identity in a way that other computers and laptops, desktops that we have just don't. When someone calls my phone, they're calling me. What I do with my phone is represent who I am and what I do. And I use it under the most personal circumstances. So more than half of people surveyed will, uh, will say that they use their phones lying in bed. I know I do. Probably a lot of you do too. Yes, show of hands. Are we awake? Okay. More than half of us use our phones in bed. Um, some people will even admit to checking them at the dinner table. <laughs> Fewer of you will admit to that. All right, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands on the next one, but in an anonymous survey, even more people will admit to this one. <clears throat> so so these, these devices really are with us all the time, um, and they represent who we are. Uh, and we're not shy about it. There is a third thing that is really interesting and different about mobile. Um, and that is, this thing's not just a phone. It's not just a messaging platform or a GPS device or a camera. It's all of those things. But it's also a platform that gives us access to hundreds and thousands of applications and services. And it, in fact, has 100,000 times the compute power of the Apollo guidance computers that landed astronauts on the moon. So, dude, we're all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets. Uh, and we can do interesting things with that. Now, you're probably wondering, when is she going to start talking about Facebook? Um, but in a way, I already have. Because Facebook and mobile are incredibly intertwined. We have over a billion users on Facebook, and most of them, more than 800 million of them, are accessing us on mobile. Uh, between Facebook and Instagram, on the flip side, people are spending an incredible amount of time on their mobile devices. 20% of that time, one in every five minutes, is spent with our services. Um, so judging by those stats, I figure at least some of you are on Facebook right now, and more of you will be by the end of the talk. That's fine with me. Um, but it wasn't always this way. In fact, as little as a year ago, uh, there were a lot of headlines like this that basically speculated that mobile was, in fact, Facebook's Achilles heel, that it was what was going to kill us. Um, we couldn't monetize it. Our apps sucked. We didn't seem to have like a clear strategy. Um, and, and so the external perception was that mobile was going to be really, really bad for Facebook and, in fact, disrupt us. Um, internally, we never had that fear. We always knew that mobile was our destiny. Um, and that, that Facebook and mobile were, were intertwined, that mobile was, in, in fact, incredibly powerful for us. Um, but we knew that the, the germ of truth in these headlines was we were not living up to our potential on mobile, that we had to execute better and faster and deliver more value to our users. Um, and, we spent the, and we spent a good amount of time doing just that. So I want to talk to you through some of the lessons that we've learned in that time. Um, I think other folks today... Uh, certainly, our, our history, our pivot through 320 and HTML5 to native apps has been kind of well-documented and talked about uh, in a lot of forums, so I'm not going to sort of retake you through that history. But I'll give you a few other sort of kind of war stories of, of that are a little, uh, a little more recent in time, a little closer to home. Um, Facebook is a company born in the years of the web, um, and our engineers have always craved to move really fast. We ship our web application twice a day. Um, and uh, and we that that sort of group of millennials to this group of, of millennials who are born um, in the days of, of web software they don't really I started my career in software in the 1990s when software looked more like this picture here on the left um, and building desktop software compared to web software is kind of like the dark ages 
Um, you know, you had to kind of build something for a long time to ship it. You had to burn it on a CD and send it out to the world in boxes. You had to kind of hope that people installed it. Once they did, you really had no idea what they were using, how they were using it. You didn't know if you were successful because of or in spite of the choices that you made. Um, and if you broke something really bad and wanted to fix it, well, you could ship an update but really have no clue if it was going to be um, ever received. Uh, and you could find yourself um, dealing with old versions of your software and backwards compatibility forever. Um, and luckily, all those problems went away with the web. Um, and we were able to develop software and move faster. Mobile comes along, and especially native mobile development, after we all got over our HTML5 hangovers. And, um, and it's kind of in between. It's, uh, it's definitely always a connected device, so we can ship updates without um, having to pray. But um, your code's not running on your own hardware. It's running on somebody else's hardware. Uh, install is still at the mercy of the user deciding they want to uptake. Um, and you know you can't, you can't ship twice a day, that's for sure. Um, and so the, with the arrival of native, we sort of introduced you know, a building full of millennial software engineers to really foreign concepts like schedule chicken or test matrices that, that didn't have a place in their vocabulary before. Um, and so it was important to kind of figure out how we were going to address those things and how we could be different and better from the bad old desktop days um, that most of us who remember uh, do not remember fondly. Um, so one very important thing was for us to get on a train release model and, um, and sort of kill the schedule chicken dead. We have mobile development going on in every product team at Facebook. Uh, and so there was, um, it was way too easy for if the messaging feature is not quite ready and we wait for that, then that messes up the plans of the photos team. And meanwhile, the feed team is already on to the next thing. So uh, we decided pretty early on and uh, made a pretty big and important move to be on an absolutely strict, predictable four week schedule Every fourth Thursday, the train leaves the station. If you're on it, you go. If not, you wait till the next time. Um, and that has been a huge increase in speed and predictability for every team. But we get, uh, we get something else with mobile that, that resembles the desktop world, particularly Android, which is device proliferation. Um, world, life for a, for a web engineer at Facebook is pretty easy. If you write code and it works on your dev server, it's pretty much going to work on the production servers. It may be broken in exotic ways, but like not in ways that are because of different uh, environments, different hardware environments. But on Android, all of a sudden, we're back to the world of tons of carriers, tons of handset manufacturers, tons of operating systems, tons of uh, UI uh, metaphors. Like all of a sudden, we have this test matrix to worry about, and uh, and you can get really fun bugs like this one. Um, we noticed that we had a high firing crash during in the photo upload phase. And it was a strange crash um, because we had never seen an employee encounter it. And uh, so we didn't have all the internal data and logging that we would have for an employee crash. Um, but we had really good, um, we, had luck, we have very good monitoring of crashes in production. We receive a set of logs. And we were able to notice that the common factor amongst all these logs um, was that they all, all these crashes were coming from about 10 specific and unique devices. And we were further able to figure out that what those 10 devices had in common was one specific version of one specific CPU. And that was a smoking gun that pointed the finger at a small amount of native code in our photo upload process, which compresses the photo before uploading it to reduce data consumption. Um, and with that information, we were finally able to reproduce and find the bug, which otherwise would have been, you'd never find it. You'd never see it from just staring at the code. Um, we also luckily had a server-side switch to turn off the compression of the photos, and we were able to flip that switch for just those 10 devices. So for the next three, four weeks, those users had slow photo uploads, but not crashing photo uploads. We also were able to quickly fix the bug, get it onto the next train, and within four weeks, those users now had speedy and working and reliable photo uploads. Um, so this was overall a pretty good success story for a set of infrastructure we've built at Facebook. First of all, um, really good monitoring of production, the ability to tell that you've had a photo um, uh, crash spiking, um, server-side control over individual features so you can turn them on and off when they're flaky and target, that, target those switches at particular users and devices, um, the ability to slice and dice the analytics to slice our data such that we could tie this crash to these set of, of devices, and finally the train model, which, uh, which got the fix out there sort of quickly and predictably. 
But fundamentally, you don't want bugs like this to be hitting production at all. And, um, and in a bug like this, how, how do you avoid bugs like this hitting production? Because it's with the number and variety and, and matrix of devices and software that are out there on Android, um, testing every one of them uh, is impractical. And even if it were practical, it would be incredibly slow. There's no way we could ship every four weeks if we had to sort of test every feature on every, in every combination like that. Um, and so the solution was, uh, I think, one of the sort of best, um, best things for both speed and quality. It's, it's one of the one of those magical win-wins that is neither a time nor a space trade-off, but gives you more of both. Um, and that is the Android beta program. Um, and so Facebook it was one of the first adopters as soon as beta program was available on Android. We've got now more than a million users in our beta program. Um, those users experience our builds in real time with us as we're developing them. And so we have three, four weeks of coverage from a million users, a million combinations of devices. And so a bug like this now would manifest in our beta program. It would be seen by a small number of users who are committed to helping us find and stamp out such bugs. We would fix it, and it would never hit users at all. And so that's actually one of the sort of amazing success stories of the beta program, and I recommend it to anybody trying to develop mobile apps at scale. Um, but there's other things we like to do with data at Facebook. Um, data is enormously helpful for finding and fixing bugs, as the photo upload story illustrates. But it is also <coughs> a, the way that we like to design features, which is iteratively in conversation and interaction with our users. So <coughs> um, l late uh, last summer, we decided that we wanted to um, uh, revisit the, the design for core navigation of our apps. On the left was, uh, is represented here a picture of sort of the sliding drawer. Facebook created this kind of sliding drawer widget with the, with the three horizontal lines. It's internally, we uh, call it the hamburger menu. And, um, and it's been widely copied, it's been successful, but we felt it was kind of a laundry list. We felt there wasn't like really super clear distinction between the most important things and actions and sort of everything else. Um, and we just wanted to try something else that would make it simpler and easier for users to get around the app and get to sort of key locations. And so we rebuilt it as a tab bar. Um, and we had some really amazing designers working on it. Um, we refined the design, we iterated, we tested in front of users, we did the thing with the one-way mirror, and we watched people use it. Um, we got something we thought was really, really, really good, um, the, which was approximately the thing on the right, the pre-iOS 7 version of it, actually. Um, and, uh, and it was high quality, it was polished, we were ready to go. Um, but before we shipped it, we wanted to do one more thing, which is see how real users are affected by it. And so we had also, while we built this new navigation paradigm, we had also been working on expanding and enhancing our A-B test framework from the web to the client. <clears throat> and so we were able to A-B test and actually have multiple versions of the tab bar appear different ways to different users in production. And so we turned this on for a small percentage of our users, between one and 5%, just a couple million people. Um, and we watched, we watched their metrics, we watched their behaviors. Um, and the feedback we got was almost all positive. Um, users really liked it. That's rare when you change something big in the UI, users mostly hate it. Um, so the fact that a lot of that feedback was positive was really a good sign. Um, and most of the metrics that we care about that were great. Um, or, or at least neutral, um, but we noticed one bad problem right away. And that is that the users in the tab bar test were liking and commenting less than the users outside the test in the control population. Um, demographically, same users. And, um, and that's bad. Uh, it's bad for their friends who are receiving fewer likes and comments. It's bad for those users because presumably that means they missed seeing stories that they would have liked to like and comment on. And indeed, we traced back the reduction in feedback to a reduction in time spent in newsfeed. And we figured out that what was going on was, <clears throat> in the old design, hamburger menu design on the left, kind of all navigation leads through newsfeed. So wherever you go, whatever sort of notifications you follow, like you return to your place in feed to get anywhere else. <coughs> And um, in the new design on the right, you'd sort of read your feed, you'd go read your messages, you'd process your notifications, you'd be left on some other tab, and you would feel done, and you would quit the app. And you would not notice that new stories had come in at the top of your feed. Um, and so you would miss the fresh stuff that was coming in while you were in that session, while you are on the app. Um, and this was a real 
problem that we wanted to solve for users. It, this we viewed as launch blocking for the tab bar. Um, and so we sprang into action and we were able to use our A-B test framework um, to figure out what would, what would solve this. And we actually built dozens of variations. We tried a lot of different tests. Um, but I'm showing you just sort of three versions here to give you a, a feel for the kinds of things that we tried. So over here on the left is the uh, kind of the, the, the Goldilocks too cold option. This is the original version of the tab bar that I just described. In here in the middle, um, the first thing we tried was, okay, well, let's just throw a little red, little red bubble up that says how many new newsfeed stories you have that, that you haven't seen yet. Um, and uh, that one performed really well. All right, that brought users back to newsfeed. We have trained Facebook users when they see a red circle with a number in it that they need to click on it. Um, and indeed, uh, it, it brought the numbers back with a vengeance. Um, but we really didn't like this design. Um, the red bubble in Facebook means something pretty specific, which is there is something here that is targeted at you. Someone has sent you a message. Someone has mentioned you in a comment. Someone has commented on one of your posts. There is a notification here that you've asked for. And um, it is not an expectation. There's no other place in Facebook where additional stories in feed actually mean something demands your attention. Um, and it so kind of breaks a, a, a mental model or even like a, an implicit commitment that more stories in feed is like it's more stuff, but it's not, uh, it's not guaranteed delivery. Um, so although it performed well on the metrics, we didn't love that one. Um, the third one I will call the Goldilocks just right version, and you may not even be able to see. Here, I'll magnify it for you. What we did is we created just a little glow on the newsfeed tab. Um, and if you have an iPhone and you have the tab bar, you may never have noticed this glow, but it's working on you. Which is when news stories come in, that tab starts to glow, and it's just enough of a hint, a little subliminal hint, that it gets you to tap, like, oh, something's, something's there on that tab, um, and it taps you back over. And, um, and that, that small glow was enough to restore the metrics to bring users back to their previous levels of feedback. And, um, and that, for us, was the right design. And so I think there's like a couple of useful lessons here. One is that um, designing without data is just, um, it's, it's just ignoring one of your best tools. Uh, we had a beautiful design that users were telling us they loved. There was a deep flaw with it that we could never have figured out without data. Um, a flaw that, that really hurt, was bad for users and bad for Facebook. Um, but second, data cannot dictate design. It can only inform it. If we just followed the data, we'd build the thing in the middle, which is not great for users, which is not great for the service, which is not great for the app. Um, and so you've got to put both together. And I think that's one of the most important things um, I, in, in consumer software in general, but I think particularly in mobile where the devices are so personal and the software running on them and the experiences on them are so personal that we've got to design for the user, right? We've got to we've, we've got to be just sort of user centric in our approach from the outset, and even as a software engineer, I think you have to be sort of hack designer and build the technology around what it enables for users. And so, um, and and bringing data into the mix uh, is a huge part of that. So I think eight. So, I guess the the moral of this story is just because it's not the web does not mean we can't A/B test. Uh, it's worth it. All right, I want to talk about one more thing. Uh, in which mobile represents both an enormous challenge and an enormous opportunity for the world. Um, about two billion people on the planet have internet access. Half of them already have Facebook. Um, another five billion people don't. Don't even have internet access to begin with. Um, and they're not gonna get it with a computer and uh, a cable connection and broadband. Uh, but they are gonna get it with a mobile device and a data connection. Um, and that means both an opportunity of five billion more people who we can connect in the world, um, but also a challenge because before now, software engineers have pretty much always been able to count on the march of progress to lift us up. As we implement more features, as we build more libraries, the hardware gets more powerful, the networks get faster, and we're able to sort of consume all that new capacity with new code. Going forward, the new users coming online, the, the emerging markets, the high-scale users, are going to be coming online with devices that look three years old, four years old from our perspective. Um, they're going to be, the device that connects the world is going to be a low-end gingerbread device with limited storage, limited memory, limited CPU, and, um, and probably a pretty expensive data plan, or rather limited um, capacity to spend a lot on data. 
And so, um, so this, we think, is like a fundamental human right to have internet access. Facebook has partnered with Sony, Ericsson, and a, a Bevy, an inter whole uh, cross-industry consortium to create an organization called internet.org whose drive is to, in fact, bring the internet to those five billion people with affordable services and new business models. But there are some real challenges to making that happen, to making that a reality, and Facebook's in a position to help with a bunch of them. One of the biggest things, as I think about our mobile infrastructure at Facebook, is how are we going to build apps that work great on those phones, on what we used to call low-end phones, and we have been retraining ourselves to call typical phones. Um, and it takes uh, a mixture, I think, of efforts. So the first thing is, it is hard to have empathy for the user carrying this device. Like, one of the great things about working at Facebook is we're all users of Facebook. We can easily have empathy for users of our software because we use it all the time. It's harder to have empathy for someone using it on a device in one of these countries. So we actually literally took a bunch of our engineers, product managers, designers, put them on planes, sent them around the world, sent them to India, sent them to Africa, sent them to South America to walk a mile in those shoes. Um, we also are building... Uh, a lab here and where our engineers reside where you can walk in, use these phones, and where we actually simulate the network conditions so that you can experience here in Menlo Park what it is like to carry one of these phones and what the user would experience in Africa or in Manila. Um, another aspect that is, gives us a position of both responsibility and capability is the sheer amount of data traveling on carrier networks that is Facebook data. You remember the stat that Facebook and Instagram are 20% of time spent on mobile. So I will leave it to your imagination how much of the data on global carrier networks is actually Facebook photos being piped around. But the amount is large. And so when we do something like adopt WebP, which is a new image standard that enables us to deliver the same quality of image with about a 20% reduction in size, we are literally able to save our collective users something like billions of dollars of cost in, data, in their data plan. Um, so even comparatively small changes impl implementable by one or two engineers in a short amount of time can have like enormous leverage on the world. So um, this is a few of the lessons we've learned along the way. You'll hear, you've heard more this morning, you'll hear more this afternoon. We're obviously slogan happy here at Facebook, and one of my favorite of our slogans is, this journey is 1% finished. We are literally just getting started. We're scratching the surface. We're learning how to adapt to a new device, a new surface, a new way that users are going to interact with technology. Um, we've, uh, we've already made some good mistakes and, uh, and had some, some great learning experiences, and I imagine all of you will too. So I'm looking forward to the next steps on this journey, and I'm looking forward to taking any questions you have about what Facebook's up to in this space and how, uh, how we're coping. Yes? Uh, hi, mm -hmm. hi, hi, Jocelyn. So when you were talking about the A-B testing mm -hmm. and you had the different uh, screens, mm -hmm. uh, was there any framework you used to decide, like uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned 1% to 5%, but then like this was not working, were you looking at for how long did you run it before you decided what mm -hmm. number or what variation? What? Mm -hmm. okay. um, well, one real luxury of having a user base our size is that a, a one or two percent test is usually a couple million people. Um, and so it takes a comparatively small amount of time to accumulate a lot of data. Um, it, there are certainly types of changes that suffer from novelty effects. We find that uh, three days, is, it depends on the change, but three days is often sort of a magical number. You want to wait a little more than three days to, to see those effects smooth out. But actually, for most of the tests in the tab bar case, it didn't take that long. The data that we were getting right away was predictive all along. I mean, the good news is if you're accidentally believing, like if you start acting on your data right away and then you notice three days later it changes sharply, you realize you've got a novelty effect and after that you have to wait. But um, for the most part, this set of changes just manifested right away. I mean, it wasn't something for users to learn. It was just how they responded. I have a question about the Android beta. Mm -hmm. So how does it fit with your training model, and um, how often do you release to beta, and things mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Um, it, 
the way our train model, our train model is actually an eight week sequence. So we do four weeks on master, we cut to the release branch and then we stabilize the release branch for four weeks. Um, and we have two of those going at any given time that are pipelined. So every four weeks results in a release. And so um, as soon as we cut onto that release branch, we start, release, we, start uh, we give ourselves a few days, but uh, then we start shipping the release branch to the beta, the beta user population and we go usually three times a week, although we have the capacity to go more often if, uh, if we need to. I'll let the mic runner, I guess I let the mic runner decide. Sorry. Do you have any plans to release uh, some Android framework that you are developed for your internal usage? Um, and yeah, so like Square does. Do we intend to release any of our Android frameworks? Um, possibly. I mean, we, we do ship a lot of open source. Um, there are a number of things. There are actually a number of open source projects that we contribute back to, like Oh, I think uh, Buck is a big one, and there's a few others. Um, but uh, we, we make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. It's usually, I mean, it's never that we consider those things sort of proprietary or, or a competitive advantage. We're pretty open about stuff like this. I mean, we, you know, we open sourced all the specs to our data center hardware, which is like much more of a competitive advantage if you think about it. Um, it's more uh, just like a trade-off of do we have the time? Open sourcing thing takes time and energy that we could be spending on making our apps better. Uh, good morning. When you started using iOS 7, were there any uh, surprises in good or bad that you experienced that you could tell us? Um, yeah, well, iOS 7 definitely was a ton of work. It was way more work to adopt than iOS 6 was, so that was definitely a surprise. Um, we thought that um, it would be somewhat of a superficial change, um, that we'd sort of test, find a few bugs, fix them, and, uh, you know, adopt some UI and be ready to go. So I think the big surprise was it was, uh, you know, much more structural and, and deeper seated than that. Um, but, you know, were there things that we couldn't cope with? No, I mean, it just was a question of, uh, you know, time and energy. Um, actually, the, the good surprise was um, iOS 7 significantly reduced our crash rate uh, on the iOS app, like uh, much more than we anticipated. Um, we knew that we knew that at least three of our top ten crashes were at least Apple implicated, but um, they, they did good on crashes in iOS 7, which I actually was worried about because it seemed like they were coming in really, really hot. So I was worried about it making the crash rate worse, but it in fact made it much better. Just a quick follow-up. Are you using SpriteKit, UIKit Dynamics? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find out. Or there may, if somebody else in the room knows the answer to that question, feel free to chime in. Uh -huh. You can ask Alan Canisterro this afternoon. He'll definitely know. Hi. Uh, so with the, you mentioned your uh, native code for image compression. How many devices or CPUs do you have to test to make sure it works across them all? I mean, I'd, I'd like to do that yeah. too, basically. But I don't want to buy 500 devices. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do comparatively little device-specific testing. We mostly rely on user testing to get device coverage. So um, for the sort of first line of defense is always our own employees um, who have a wide variety of Android devices, but definitely having a million users in the beta is a big, big luxury. Um, yeah. Um, how do you handle pushing your server-side switches down to users? Like if your app is resident for a long time, you can't mm -hmm. just do it at startup, or do you piggyback on requests, or do you do something else? Yeah, we do it at request time. Okay. So the, the server-side. The um, <coughs> apps can cache state, so you can get in a, a little bit of a, a, a weird state, but you just have to have really good caching policy, and then at request time, you get the right stuff. But you also have to be really careful server-side, and, and you know, this was another thing that was sort of a, a learning experience for our web developers moving to mobile, is you, know, you can't just retire a switch once you've rewritten the code, the client-side code, to you know, not pay attention to that switch anymore, because there's still old clients out there in the world, which is especially a problem for us, actually, on Android, because so many carriers do preload of really early versions of Facebook. So um, you also have to just have like really good discipline about eternal backwards compatibility on the server side. 
Um, uh, so, and so on Android, you guys deal with a lot of people who won't upgrade their phones. Um, how about those users that won't upgrade their apps? So like really, really early version? Um, yeah. Do you, do you try to like force them or just like leave like different versions? Yeah, we've been actually very scrappy about Android upgrades. In fact, we, um, <coughs> we put a lot of effort into Android upgrades this year. <coughs> um, it turns out, I mean, I, I wouldn't say users won't upgrade, first of all, like actually that sort of personalizes it as like there's somebody on the other end who's saying like, I don't want it. And that's actually never, the, that's like usually not the problem. Like that's sort of how you imagine the problem when you're looking at a crummy upgrade, upgrade rate, but then once you start working on it and digging into what are the things, it's really obstacles, it's barriers keeping them from upgrading. Um, so it turned out one of the biggest issues that, was, that made it difficult for users to upgrade or, or hard is um, when our app demands new permissions because that kind of uh, <laughs> totally breaks, like that totally derails users from upgrading. Just the, like, hands down the, the biggest factor. Um, and it just takes forever and ever to recover from a breaking permission change. So the solution, there's not much you can do about that other than do not change permissions very often, like, like just delay, like batch them up um, and, uh, and do that as, as seldom as you can. Um, and we now require like, a, there has to be like a pretty huge advantage to justify um, taking a new breaking permission. Um, after that one, uh, a lot of times the issue for users is um, uh, just storage. Like our app is large, and the larger it is, the harder it is, um, both the more it costs users in data. Like in South America, the size of the Facebook app, just the, like we think Facebook's free, right? It's a free download from the Play Store. It costs $2 in data for in, in South America on an average data plan to download a new version of the Facebook app. If we ship that every four weeks, we're costing them $2 every month. Would you, I mean, it's $25, it's like a $25 a year fee to use Facebook. I mean, not counting our hot fixes, so, I don't know, we conservatively increase that. Um, so uh, making the app size smaller, um, dividing it up so we can put the app on the SD card, uh, there's just sort of whole set of other things that we can do. Um, we also happen to have like a really great advertising framework. So one of the, like, it turns out that one of the best ways in the world to get users to install an app is to run a Facebook app install ad. Um, and so we can just do a lot of in-house promotions to just promote to users that they should upgrade their app um, to the latest version of Facebook. And those turn out to be really effective. And that's, that's available to the world, not just to Facebook. Um, so like a collection of scrappy techniques, like each of them is good for like a chunk of upgrade rates. And then when you get down to like the end, you get down to people whose phones like literally ship with no breathing room. There's literally not space. Um, and so we've thought about different things. There are, there are versions, we're really reluctant to just cut users off, even though there's always the web. I mean, they can always use the phone's browser to access m.facebook.com. Um, we decided to cut off Honeycomb. Uh, because we just physically could not support it um, and make it anything but any reliable at all. Um, and so um, on, on that version of Android, uh, you have to use the web. The native app stops working. Um, we are reluctant to go there just to try to get people to upgrade because at this point, most of the things keeping people from upgrading are like literally barriers. It's not that they don't, it's not that they could if, if, if they would, it's like mostly now a could issue. Um, have you done anything, or what is your, or can you comment on the intersection of network and battery impact, given that the radio is the second most expensive thing to battery on a mobile phone? Yes. Um, I mean, I think this is just one of those things where you've got to invest in really good instrumentation framework, um, and it's sort of like, you know, I think of quality, uh, you know, we use the word quality to mean a lot of different things. I think there's like a reliable, there's a product experience aspect of quality, which like the tab bar design that I talked about, like does it feel good? There is a reliability aspect to quality, like what's your crash rate? iOS 7 helped us out there. There is a performance aspect to quality. Is the app speedy? Is it responsive? Does it start quickly? And then the fourth one is efficiency. And Facebook is actually very used to thinking about efficiency as a branch of quality, but we thought about the efficiency of our code running on our servers and about the amount of money we would save in data center costs. On native, what we have to think about is the efficiency, the footprint that we're landing on the user's phone. How efficient are we being with their precious resources? And, and data and power are kind of the two key ones. There's also storage, but that ends up being more of a reliability issue. Um, and so I think the most important thing is, um, uh, I mean, the good news is it's sort of a win-win. Like, we want to reduce data costs. Like, not just to help our users in general or, or, you know, in the spirit of goodness, but actually, like, it's kind of central to the whole internet.org idea that we're going to bring the emerging world online. 
Um, and I think Facebook, maybe more than a lot of the apps that you folks work on, has, a, has an emerging world, has a large emerging world demographic. I mean, we're not just a, a US or a, or a, a European user base. Um, and so we do spend a lot of time thinking about data consumption and wanting to bring that down. Um, so we have a desire to make that better um, independent of power, but also for power. Um, I would say power is a second, is, is a less high priority for us than data only because it's not a source of major user complaints, but it's the kind of thing where if you accidentally screw it up, you've done something awful. Um, so the most important thing is to build really good measurement and instrumentation of these factors. And, and that's, you know, we're just, we're just at the birth of mobile in this respect, right? Like we don't have the same kind of well-oiled, mature tooling from the platform vendors or from third parties that, that you do on other more mature technology stacks. So um, we're building a lot of that ourselves um, because we think it's necessary. Yeah. Can, you, uh, can you talk about the promise <coughs> of HTML5 and the reality of HTML5 and, and compared to native and then maybe a little bit about where wearables are? Where what are? Wearables. 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 Um, first, first about HTML5. Yeah, about I, I'm not going to comment on wearables. I don't have a lot to say about wearables yet. I mean, I think they're coming, but um, they're not in, I, I'm more focused on making our current stuff really, really good than um, we'll worry about wearables later. Um, on, uh, on HTML5, um, I, I think Facebook felt like we made the wrong choice for our users when we committed so heavily to HTML5 at the outset. Um, you know, I think that choice was very much more about looking at mobile and wanting to do mobile the Facebook way and not sacrifice the benefits of speed and autonomy that, that we had. Um, and frankly, you know, we had hundreds of ramped engineers on HTML and, you know, almost none on Objective-C. So, uh, you know, I, I, th I think we, we made those choices for reasons that were good for us but not good for our users. And um, but fundamentally, it is much better for us. And I think if HTML5 reaches a place where we can deliver better experiences, as good experiences as native for users, then it's hands down far better. I mean, you know, I talked about download si upgrades. That problem goes away. <laughs> um, you know, download size, you can have a much tinier footprint on the phone. Um, crashes, I, like, I want to say maybe it's hard to debug out of memory with web apps and, like, figure out where you went wrong. But like that's one category of crashes versus like once you write a ton of native code, now you have an infinite surface for crashes. So like on every quality access except like responsiveness and, and holistic user experience, like HTML5 is going to be a clear win, not least because when we find a problem, we can fix it immediately and not have to wait four weeks for the train. So, um, so I think we have not lost hope, actually. Um, as soon as HTML5 can deliver a great quality of experience, we will want to be back on it. Um, and there are certainly still places in our apps where we actually do use web views um, just for efficiency or, or convenience, or but the sort of less trafficked surfaces, honestly. Um, so I think we have, you know, perpetually stuff going on in the lab um, uh, to sort of keep the, the flames of hope alive. But, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're not going to move back to HTML5 until it's better for users, not just better for us. Do you, do you do face-to-face -face usability testing with users? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a user research team, um, and we get a lot of great insights from that. Um, and it's, it's something that's actually incorporated into the train. So each product team will do their own independent stuff. Like in the, if you're the messaging team, like in the course of developing a feature like chat heads, you'll do a lot of usability studies. But then we also, in the release team, I'm waving this direction because the head of our RelEng team is in the front row. Hi, Christian. Um, in the release team, like we are act as part of the release process, we actually then take like a holistic app UEX sweep um, with every with every release in the train. So even a comparatively small feature that doesn't um, you know that, that doesn't kind of have the resources to go do its own UEX testing will get at least a little coverage in the holistic app. Yeah, but it's, it's very valuable. It just gives you a different kind of insight. I mean, you've got to marry them both together, and then at the end of the day, you also just have to like be a human and make human decisions. Uh, hi. Um, you, you mentioned something about power mm -hmm. before of not being a priority, but mm. I think one of the problems with your messenger app is, is it drains my battery when I'm chatting with my friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, like iMessage doesn't do that, right? I mean, if, if I, I noticed that I could have a full battery, and if mm -hmm. I'm there half an hour mm -hmm. chatting with my friends, I've lost 60% of my battery life, or, or some, it's, it drains at an accelerated rate, is okay. what I think. And I, I think that that's. 
Because um, you, you, I would you say said that's, it not wasn't the, a... that's not the typical rate, so that definitely sounds like a bug. Um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so when I say power is not a priority, like let me be clear, power is a priority. Power is important. We can't if we drain 60% of someone's battery in an hour, like that's a, a show-stopping bug that we would fix. Um, and measuring power. So to that extent, like building the frameworks to measure power and make sure that we're not like out of control is absolutely a big priority for Facebook. Um, what uh, it, it in terms of like where we're sort of actively going and like cranking to optimize and make it better, we have data consumption higher on the list. That's that's I would not say it's not a priority. I would just say it's behind data consumption in general. But that also sounds like a bug. Like let's mm -hmm. let's uh, let's get a look at your phone after the event. Oh. Well, can we can introduce you to people in the messenger team. I think we're pretty much. Am I out of time? Or? Can I take one more question? Okay, we want time for one more quick one. And then All we'll right. Pick. Uh, who's got the mic? I think the mic runners get to be the decision maker here. Sorry. <laughs> I really like the chat heads in mm -hmm. iOS 7, at 6, mm -hmm. uh, when they were introduced. And I think they introduced like uh, the, the new physics system in, uh, in the UI, which mm -hmm. then Apple adopted. Um, but in uh, iOS 7, the whole UI feels a little bit less fresh. For some reason, um, I, it doesn't feel as exciting as it used to be before. And I was wondering whether mm. you noticed this um, feedback from other people. Um, I think we feel like we did the minimal pass for iOS 7. I think we could have really reinvented the entire app around the iOS 7 look and feel. And we just um, didn't decide to do that. So I think we kind of took on an iOS 7 veneer. Um, and actually, we ended up even doing a little more than we initially intended to. Not, not, not because we don't want to, but because I, this a little bit does go to Facebook structure, which is that rather than have a singular iOS team, it's really each feature team doing their own iOS work. And so when iOS 7 came along, um, I think like each feature team was already committed to other features that they were more excited about building and, and delivering. Um, and so I think you will see over time, as, um, as those roadmaps sort of come to fruition and we plan kind of the next round of stuff, um, you'll see, I think, more of Facebook taking advantage of sort of that new iOS 7 sort of just capabilities and, and freshness. But, you know, we, we, we have a lot of different priorities in the app. And, um, and I think one thing we do know, it's not maybe quite as severe or obviously measurable as a breaking permissions change. but Users take Facebook personally, surprise. <laughs> and, and when we change it, when we move things around on them and, and change their muscle memory, like they take that personally too. Like users actually don't love it when Facebook changes. And, and obviously we do continue to change it anyway because we feel strongly that we will become stale, that we should disrupt ourselves before somebody else does it. Um, but I think that you've got to like, we're probably not going to launch a feature, a UI change as big as chat heads every month um, because I think that really would be wildly um, uncomfortable for for our users. So it's, and, and like breaking permissions change, like we'll do them if there's a good reason to, if like there's a big win for users in it, but we might like save it up and not be hitting people with it all the time. All right. Tab bar was a pretty big change. Thank you very much, Justin. <laughs> Round of applause, please.